Mark. Uh, we're all familiar with the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. But I'm going to read from Mark chapter 1 and just the first eight verses. So Mark chapter 1, and we'll take up the reading from verse 1. It says this. I have a little head in my Bible that says, John the Baptist prepares the way. Then it says this. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him Confessing their sins, they were baptised by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptise you with water, but he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. And we just pray, Lord, we do. We just thank you again uh, for your help this morning. We thank you again for your presence. You are worthy of our praise. Uh, we thank you for what you've done in our lives. We thank you for what you are yet going to do. We thank you that the best is still yet to come. We believe it. We sense it. We feel it. Uh, thank you. Lord, for helping us again to remember the price you paid for us yes. on that cross at Calvary. Mm -hmm. You were the sinless one, the righteous one, the holy one. You were the only one who wasn't tainted by mm -hmm. original sin. And you went to the cross, mm -hmm. the innocent one, and paid the price mm -hmm. for our sins. And we just praise you and bless you for that. And as we look at your word together, we ask you to continue with us by your Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. We ask that your anointing would rest upon hearers and speakers hearer and speaker alike, Lord, and we pray that you and you alone will be glorified and exalted and lifted up this morning. And we ask this in Jesus' lovely name. Amen. Amen. Okay, the message that I was going to bring this morning was really just by way of, you know, introduction. And as I said, can't find it anywhere. I, I don't know what I did with it. I don't know where I put it. It was a mad, yeah, you know, everything over the Christmas and everything else. And I was studying in our bedroom uh, in front of Margaret's makeup table and everything it could be anywhere but really what i was going to say it was really by way of introduction to this uh, uh wonderful gospel of mark and you know no prizes for uh guessing who wrote it the name is fairly obvious mark uh, he, he was often known as john mark uh, he is the one that uh, you might remember that when they came to arrest uh, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, you might remember the story recorded in the scripture where they grabbed hold of one of his followers and they basically ripped the clothes off him and this young man fled naked. So uh, I, I don't like to refer to him and being respectful, you know, as a, as a streaker or anything like that. But uh, he's the young man that fled naked away uh, when they had all deserted Jesus. He also accompanied Paul on his missionary journeys later on, and uh, he, he, he was a, a great disciple, uh, a godly disciple, and he is the one who wrote the Gospel of Mark, but he's often referred to as John Mark. And if I had been doing the message that I prepared to, uh, for this morning, or I skipped on to the second one, we would have seen in our introduction to Mark that uh, that God always keeps his promises. Uh, it was written about Isaiah the prophet. Isaiah, thousands of years early, we're told, wrote this. He said, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And then it says, and so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So Isaiah, thousands of years prior to this, the prophet Isaiah prophesied this, prophesied that there would be a forerunner, a messenger who would appear before Jesus commenced his ministry aged 30 years 
of age. And we see here that John, first and foremost, uh, was a preacher. And we're going to see that God has always had his preachers. He has had them in the old, he had them in the Old Testament. He had them in the New Testament. He has them still today. And he will have them until this world, as we know it, is finished. Till this world, as we know it, is finished over and i just want to read a couple of verses from romans you can turn to it if you wish or listen whatever you're most happiest with but in romans chapter 10 and paul as we know wrote this letter to the church in rome uh, they were a group of christians just like us uh, no different except that they lived of course in rome and at a different time and he says this in Romans chapter 10 and verse 13 regarding you know preaching the word regarding speaking the word regarding telling the word and he says in Romans 10 verse 13 for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved and then he says this in verse 14 how then can they call on the one they have not believed in and how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard and how can they hear without someone preaching to them and how can anyone preach unless they are sent as it is written how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news and I love that verse it means a lot to me and I can remember my dad many 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 years ago uh, I, I, many of you know that I had, was a backslider for, for 17 years. Many of you know that I had no interest in, no interest in spiritual matters, no interest in God, no interest in Jesus, no interest in the Bible. Uh, I, I would have avoided people like you, like the plague. Uh, you know, and, and you know that. If I saw a Christian coming towards me, I would have ducked into a shop. I would have. Uh, you know, I would have got down and pretended to be tying my shoelace. I, I, I would have just stayed away from Christians. I wanted nothing to do with Christians. I wanted nothing to do with spiritual matters. I wanted nothing to do with God. I certainly didn't want God having a say in how I lived my life. I wanted to do my own thing, even though, uh, as many of you know, my life was a mess, even though I was uh, addicted to alcohol, even though I was addicted to many other things that I couldn't break free from. I still didn't want God in my life. I, I, I thought I can handle this myself. And I can remember when the Lord restored me 17 years later, uh, after 17 years of this lifestyle, when I was a, 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 you know, a broken man, I was broken emotionally, I was broken mentally, psychologically, I was broken medically, I, I was in very bad health. In every way spiritually mentally physically uh, and I can remember one of the first messages I heard my uh, father preach and he was preaching about John the Baptist and I always remember a certain quote and he, he, he said uh, the Bible he was using put it this way there was a man sent from God whose name was John there was a man sent from God whose name was John and then he went on to make the point that in Jesus' day and in John the Baptist's day, and even today when it comes to missions, evangelism, outreaches, he said, uh, many went, but John was sent. Many went, but John was sent. You know, and that could, uh, different context, many perhaps went out as missionaries to Africa, many went into maybe different outreaches here in Ireland to help uh, people w w with these addictions or those addictions or these problems or that problems and there was nothing wrong yet yeah, 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 they went but the huge difference was in this particular case with John John was sent there was a man sent by God or sent from God whose name was John and John uh, the baptizer John the Baptist as he's often known uh, is one of the first preachers we read about in the New Testament. So John the Baptist was a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. He was a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy.
prophecy. And we see this clearly in the book of Isaiah, chapter 40 and verse 3. Thousands of years before, before this, Isaiah wrote this uh, in Isaiah, chapter 40 and verse 3. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. This is thousands of years. This, this is a prophecy that was prophesied, that was spoke, that was written by Isaiah the prophet <laughs> thousands of years before John even showed up on the scene. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And I find this really interesting, and I trust you will as well, uh, what Jesus thought about and what Jesus had to say about John the baptizer, who, as many of us know, was a first cousin of Jesus. We know that Elizabeth, who was married to Zechariah, and we are told that during the time of Mary's pregnancy, uh, she made her way up to visit Elizabeth, her cousin. Elizabeth was six months, and we looked at this in previous studies, Elizabeth was six months with child, six months pregnant at the time. Uh, Mary was in the very early stages of her pregnancy. She had just been told by the Archangel Gabriel that she was going to conceive the long-awaited Messiah by the power of the Holy Spirit, and she went up to visit her cousin. So, uh, Jesus and John were first cousins. And Jesus held John in extremely, and that's putting it mildly, in extremely high regard and high esteem. Uh, it's absolutely incredible what Jesus had to say about John the Baptist. Jesus says this about John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 11, Matthew chapter 11 and verse 7. Okay, this is Jesus speaking. Not me, it's not my words, but John, in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 7, it says this. As John's disciples, meaning John the Baptist's disciples, were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? He asked. A reed swayed by the wind. If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No. Those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes. I tell you. More than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. And here Jesus is referring back to the, pro to the prophecy we just read from Isaiah. Then he says this, Truly I tell you, among those born of women, there is not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence and violent people have been raided in it for all the prophets and the law prophesied unto John. But he, I, I repeat this, he says again, I tell you, I tell you, this is Jesus, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. I mean... What, you know, what, what an honor, what a privilege to have Jesus say something like that about you. I mean, what a reference. Imagine if John lived in or worked in a secular job and, you know, he, he took it to someone that he wanted to employ him as this or that or the other. And you had that written on your CV, what Jesus Christ, the Messiah, had said about you. And imagine it was Jesus who said it. It wasn't John the Baptist saying it about himself. It was Jesus who said it. Uh, and then we know that Jesus also 
speaking about King David in Acts 13, uh, it's uh, verse 22, he says, uh, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will carry out all my will. And again, we know David committed a terrible sin. Well, uh, terrible sins. We know it, it, it was horrendous, his sin with Bathsheba, when he committed adultery with Bathsheba. And then to make matters worse, he arranged to have Bathsheba's husband Uriah, one of his most loyal generals, taken out, deliberately killed uh, when they were attacking uh, a foreign city. And we know, however, that David genuinely, genuinely, there's a big difference between genuine repentance and fake repentance. David genuinely uh, repented of that sin, of those sins. And you know that uh, he continued on as king, though he lived with the consequences of those forgiven sins for the rest of his life. And some of us here this morning, because of previous sins, uh, mistakes, seriously wrong decisions, uh, certain actions that we did in a previous lifestyle, even though the Lord has forgiven us and we have been genuinely uh, forgiven, genuinely restored, genuinely back in fellowship with him, uh, the Lord has wiped the slate clean. Some of us still live with the consequences of those forgiven sins. Uh, certain things we can't go back and redo. We can't rewrite history. Certain things we did we wish we hadn't done, uh, but we have. Uh, it's water under the bridge. We make amends sometimes when we can. Sometimes we can't. Uh, sometimes it's possible, sometimes it's not. But we praise him and bless him when he forgives, he lifts that guilt, he lifts that condemnation, and we move on. So this is what Jesus said about John. And uh, the Lord tells David, or speaks about David, and says uh, that he is a man, I have found a man after my own heart. David, despite his sins, had a real shepherd's heart. So. When I was thinking about this, about John the Baptist and what the Lord said about him, there's never been you know, a man or a woman born of woman who is greater than John. I couldn't help but think about Margaret's late mother. Um, you know, she passed away a number of years ago. She, gosh, she was a great woman. You, you know those typical mother-in-law jokes? She was anything but. She, she was the most untypical mother-in-law. She was a Tipperary woman and she had some really Gosh, she had some really funny expressions. Even though she'd come up to Dublin to find work, gosh, it, it, it's, a, it's an amazing story. She was only, I don't know, Margaret, was she 16? 14. Younger? 14. She was 14. I mean, today, it's, when you think about it, crazy. She comes up from the back of Tip, Tipperary as a young 14-year-old, and she is uh, this very kind uh, captain in the army, finds her digs and gets her a job in Roundtree, Sweet Factory and everything. But she had all these amazing old expressions. And sometimes when she used to come and stay with us for a couple of months uh, in the year, in her latter years, you know, obviously I got to know her extremely well. And we had some great crack with her. And sometimes I, now I stress, I'd only be pretending to frighten her. You know, I'd be pretending to intimidate her. I tell you, Annie, I'll get you in a headlock. I, you know, I, I would be messing about this, and she, she used to look at me, and she sometimes had that steely look in her eyes. She said, I'll tell you something, Stephen, she said, there's never been a man born yet, she says, that I'm afraid of. She said, there's never been a man, she says, I don't care what size he is, she says, how big he is, how strong he is, she said, I haven't met a man yet, she says, that I am afraid of, and that I wouldn't put uh, in his place. She wasn't afraid of any man no matter his size or strength. That was, uh, that, uh, that was the gospel according to Annie, as far as she was concerned. Uh, and, and Jesus said that as far as he was concerned, no man or woman born was greater than John the Baptist. 
So what type of man, what can we learn from John the Baptist? I know we now live in the 21st century, you know, with everything is so different, but what, human nature has never changed. One thing has never changed. Uh, technology has changed, science, so-called, is advancing, uh, you, know, the, 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 you know, the internet, we have the web, we have, we have all of these things, but one thing has never changed is human nature. Uh, what type of man was John? If Jesus held him in such high esteem and regard, it behoves us, I believe, to have a look at what type of man he was, that Jesus would speak so highly of him. Well, the first thing I see about John the Baptist, firstly, he was an extremely faithful man. He was uh, faithful. We're told in verse 4, Mark 1 verse 4, and so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. John was faithful in preparing the way for Jesus's arrival. He was prepared to do the hard work, the dirty work, in a sense, the grafting, the digging up the trenches, the breaking up the soil, breaking up the hard ground. Uh, he, he, he hadn't been called to come in and reap a harvest, uh, you know, uh, and, and thousands to be wonderfully and gloriously saved at his, at his preaching or everything else. That wasn't his ministry. He had been called to baptize and he baptized in the wilderness and he was faithful to that. He remained faithful to his calling through thick and thin. He remained faithful to his calling through the highs and the lows, through the mountaintop experiences, to the valley experiences. I'm sure there was times like this when he didn't know times was he up or down. But he remained faithful uh, to his calling to prepare the way for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the message he preached wasn't a popular message. It still isn't today. The message he preached was not a popular message. The message he preached was a message of repentance. Repentance, and there's a difference between repentance and penance, and we'll see that in a minute. He was called to preach a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. John's baptism wasn't necessary after Jesus' death and resurrection this baptism by John was only to be performed before Jesus's death and resurrection in other words in short John's message was now is the time today right now is the time to get right with God Jesus is coming soon get ready to get right spiritually speaking, with your Messiah and Savior. So he was faithful to his message and he was faithful in his preaching. It wasn't a popular message because the vast majority of people still today, nothing has changed, don't like to be told that they are sinners. Now some of us have no problem with that. Some of us know what sinners we were. We know that. I, I listen. I always use the illustration, but you know, certain traditions have done great harm to this. You know, with certain ways that they have taught this. Some of us here are parents. Most of us most probably are parents, except for one or two. We're all parents. We have had children. We've been blessed with three children, and we now have two grandchildren. And when our children were small, you know, when they were small, and we never ever had to teach them to tell a lie. Never had to teach them to tell a lie. We never had to teach them to take things they shouldn't take. We never had to teach them to throw tantrums. We never had to teach them to do wrong things. It came el natural. That's what we mean. We all have a bias. We all have a sinful nature. It doesn't mean that they were totally depraved or were abhorrent, horrendous sinners. That, that's not what it means. It simply means 
that we are prone to do the wrong thing. We all have a sinful nature. That newborn baby that no doubt all of us, when our own children were born and our grandchildren, you would just keep smothering with kisses. Margaret often has to say to me, ah, oh, Stephen, listen, will you stop? It's like an addiction. Will you stop? Stop kissing the child. And whatever you do, don't kiss her. Don't kiss her or him on the, on the, you know, on the lips. She said, you know, we might spread something. Stop kissing, kissing. But there's something about a newborn baby. But that, that little baby, it won't be long once they reach the terrible twos or even before that or whatever, that you see they have a little sinful nature. We have a sinful nature. The only one who was without sin was Jesus. And John was preaching this message that they were sinners, that they needed to repent, that they needed to be baptized. And the same is Today, nothing has changed. Scripture tells us that we need to turn from our sins, we need to confess our sins, and we need to start doing the opposite, going the opposite way, walk in a different direction, live in a different direction. The same <coughs> message still applies. But nobody likes that message. You see, we live in... We were talking about this during the week in IBI. We live in such a secular, post-Christian world that it's like people, there's no such thing as sin anymore for many people. There's no absolutes anymore. We live in a sinless society. You know, uh, people can do the most horrendous things and they can say, but, but it feels so good. You know, how can it be wrong? You know, uh, it's a... Uh, it feels so good. But we don't go by our feelings. We go by, we go by not even our own moral compass. We go by God's teaching on it. Uh, you know, sin is sin, whatever way we dress it up. And it's still the same message today. So if we are talking to someone <clears throat> and they ask us, you know, well, well, who are you? What are you? Uh, where do you stand on this and that? Often we refer to uh, verses that are found in Scripture. I mean, in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, regarding salvation, uh, it makes it so clear, uh, Acts 4, verse 12, there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved except the name of Jesus. We go through Jesus. As you know, I've often said, uh, Buddha didn't die on the cross for us. Uh, Muhammad didn't die on the cross for us. Confucius didn't die on the cross for us. It was Jesus, the Son of God, fully God, yet fully man. Jesus in the flesh, who went to the cross, aged 33 years of age, and hung on that cross, naked, as Michael shared this morning, often you check this out. Don't just take my word for it, check it out. I thank God uh, today that out of dignity for Jesus, whenever you see a picture, uh, he will have some sort of a, you know, a clothing or uh, a garment around his midriff. But in reality, in reality, the Romans always crucified males naked. And it's incredible to think that Jesus, the Son of God, who came, uh, and we all know, some of us have been thinking about it over the whole Christmas Advent season, he grows up, he, he, he starts his ministry at 30, and at 33 years of age, uh, still in his prime or close enough to it, they take him, uh, Michael explained it, they battered him, they stripped him naked, they beat him, they pulled clumps of uh, the beard out of his face. Isaiah tells us he was marked more than any man. Uh, the whole uh, garrison, the whole regiment of soldiers gathered around him and they great fun, entertaining themselves, playing bl blind man's buff, uh, putting a uh, robe uh, of purple on him, mocking, slagging, because that was the sign of royalty. Kings wore purple in those days. And then they nailed him naked to a cross, 
hoisted him up to die. And there on that cross, Jesus, who knew no sin, Scripture tells us, became sin for you and for me, taking our sins upon himself so that we could be forgiven and we could be set free. No wonder we're told there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. Paul writes to young Timothy, who he is mentoring, and Paul says this to him in 1 Timothy 2, 1 Timothy 2 verse 5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. Again, it's so clear. John 14, verse 6. Margaret, you've heard Margaret's story. Margaret brought up as a devout Roman Catholic. Her late father, there was eight children growing up there in a two-bedroom house in Crumlin. And their late father, their dad, would bring all the kids in, no matter where they were, every evening. And he would make them all kneel. And they would all recite decades of the rosary. And they would all uh, say a few Our Fathers and many other prayers. Jesus wasn't included in it at all. And Margaret, as a young woman, um, uh, well relatively young um, <laughs> relatively young in her late 20s when her sister Mary who has since gone to be with the Lord uh, Mary passed away uh, a year ago to this day as we know from cancer uh, she died in the hospice in Harold's Cross and when Mary came into an encounter with Jesus and when Margaret's brother James had a real encounter with Jesus, it made Margaret start to think. And she had been given a present of a Bible and she was reading it one night and a lot of it wasn't making much sense to her. And she was reading down through the Gospel of John, written by St. John. And she's reading John chapter 14 and in her own words she'll tell you, she got to verse six and she said it was like, it was like, it, the, the, the verse didn't literally jump out of the page, but it's like she could see no other verse except this, where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, except through Jesus. And at that point, Margaret started, she didn't get saved or born again at that time, but she started at that point just praying to Jesus. She stopped praying to the other individuals. Jesus says in John 3, verse 3, Jesus replied to Nicodemus, Truly I tell you, unless someone is born again, they cannot see the kingdom of God. He says in John 3, verse 7, Do not be amazed that I told you, you must be born again. You see, the, the message hasn't changed. It's still the same message today. And as New Testament believers... We must be faithful to our message. And no, we don't go out and Bible bash people. We don't grab someone and say, listen, sit down there while I tell you what you need to hear. It doesn't work like that. As we know, some of us have met people like that. That does more harm than good. But if we are ever asked, as we're told in Peter, we must always be able to give a reason and to explain as to why we believe what we believe but like John we must continue to be faithful to the message so John was faithful not only that though John was extremely humble he was a humble man and I tell you we could do with a good dose of good old-fashioned humility in these days with some of the arrogance and everything we see coming from certain quarters and people are anything but uh, humble in john chapter one we read this in verse six john chapter one verse six there was a man sent from god whose name was john he came as a witness to testify concerning that light so through him all might believe 
He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. He was humble and he was simple in appearance. He wore a camel hair garment and he wore a leather belt. He was humble in his appearance. He was humble where he lived. He lived in the desert somewhere. Uh, he was humble in diet. His pri 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 uh, primary source of food was locusts and honey. Now I'm not saying, I'm not saying that we all go start going around looking like Fred Flintstone and you know wearing camel, you know, and, and a belt and a pair of sandals. It wouldn't be long before the men in the the white coats, you know, and the the mental health boys would be pulling up outside and we'd be taken away wailing. That's not the point. But what, what, I, I, and I'm not saying either. I'm not saying either. Uh, John didn't need uh, or want a designer outfit for every day of the week. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with designer outfits. Uh, I, you know, I, I try occasionally. If there's a good old sale in Man Direct or something, I'm all for a good pair of uh, Levi's or, or, or whatever so-called designer stuff. But you know what I'm trying to say. He didn't need a designer outfit for every day of the week. He didn't need or want to draw attention to himself. And we all know people like that, don't we? Even in Christian circles, you know. I've met a lot of them. There's a kind of a swagger about them, you know. You know, a kind of a strut. You know, and they, you know, they're walking around like this in the, in the pulpit. They're, 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 it's hard to explain. You can sense it, you can feel it. They're, they're, there's an arrogance. They're full of themselves. They're full of their own importance. They, you know, they pride themselves on their name. They pride themselves on their ministry. There's just an arrogance. There's no humility about them. Uh, John was not like that. He was a powerful orator. He was a powerful preacher, very gifted, very articulate. He remember he was the son of Zechariah, the high priest. This guy, John would have been in his youth, he would have been the equivalent of rabbinically trained. He knew his scriptures. He was an academic. He, his father was the great high priest, one of the great high priests, Zechariah. Uh, he would have had an amazing theological education. Yet he's living out in the wilderness, wearing camel hair, eating locusts and wild honey, wearing a pair of old uh, leather sandals and, and an old belt to keep the, uh, you know, the, 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 the thing from falling down around him. He didn't need or he didn't want a penthouse suite in the best part of town. He was happy to live somewhere in the wilderness. God knows what he lived in in the wilderness. He didn't dine in the best of restaurants. Uh, nothing wrong with dining, please. You know, we very rarely do it. <laughs> you know, if, if, if it's our anniversary or something or a special occasion. And I'm telling you, it's not the, it's not the creme de la creme. We might do Joel's. <laughs> we might do Joel's or Nando's. Ooh. That's a really posh restaurant. Uh, dear Michael referred one to us one time and we went to go to it. It closed down. You know, the lemon something or the lemon grass. So I have to get another, you know, Margaret's birthday is coming up in May. You know, I might make a change from Joel's or Nando's. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Yeah, I know, I don't want you to misunderstand me, but he didn't need to dine in the best of restaurants every day. His staple diet was locusts and honey. Incidentally, both of those I discovered are very high in proteins and minerals. He knew exactly what he was eating. He was a humble man. He liked to keep things simple and plain. He liked to keep things uncomplicated. And most of all, he was humble in his message. Mark 1, verse 7. He was humble in his message. This was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. And it's as if he's saying, you might think I'm powerful. You might think I'm a gifted preacher. But wait till I tell you something. You really need to understand this. After me, after me, I'm only preparing the way, comes the one more powerful than I. The straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. In fact, the one coming... 
Jesus the Messiah is so powerful, I'm not even worthy <coughs> to do what a non-Jewish Gentile slave could do. I'm not even worthy to bend down and untie his sandals. I'm not even worthy, he's saying, to walk on the same ground as him. My baptism is with water. I baptize you with water. I'm baptizing you here in the Jordan by immersion with water. That's only an outward symbol. But his, Jesus's though, is going to be inward. His baptism is going to be with the Spirit. He is going to be a million times more powerful. He, his is going to be the real thing. I, John, am only baptizing you with water, but he, Jesus, is going to baptize you in and with the Holy Spirit. The one Jesus who is coming, number one, is mightier than I am. Number two, he is more powerful than I am. Number three, he's more worthy than I am. Number four, he's more holy than I am. And then he says, and I love this in John 3, verse 3. And with this, I close. John 3, verse 3. One of my favorite expressions, and I've often thought about it. And it's good to teach us. It's, 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 it's good to keep us humble. John 3, I beg your pardon, verse 30 says this. He must become greater, I must become less. Another translation, the old authorised version says, he must increase and I must decrease. You see, John's ministry was not about himself. It was all about Jesus. Everything revolved around Jesus. Everything. Jesus was the centre of it all, and it should be the same for you and for me. It's not about us. It's not about what giftings we might have or don't have. It's not about how good we might be able to do this, speak, preach, evangelize, play an instrument, uh, whatever the case may be. It's not about us. It's about him. He, Jesus, must increase. And you and I need to get out of the limelight if we are in the limelight or if we're tempted to get into the limelight. And we must decrease. And you and I, like John, we need to stay faithful and we need to stay humble in our calling and in our ministry. So I trust and pray that would be of some encouragement to someone here this morning.